Hello, welcome. My name is Simon Rindel. Uh, I'm the founder of Advanced Product Delivery. I've been working with Improving for a number of years, and it's a, an honor and a privilege to be able to share my thoughts here at the Improving Edge. My session today is uh, you don't grow a plant by pulling at the leaves. Um, and in this, I, mean, I, I really enjoy using metaphors because it's a great way to get my thoughts across. And I'm going to use that metaphor to describe how we support change and growth in our teams. Uh, now, as we um, go through the session, um, please engage. I'd love it if you engaged, use question and answers. Please send messages through the chat. Uh, greatly appreciated. We're also using a tool called Mentimeter.com. Uh, it is using an app called Menti. And to make it easy for you to connect, you can either scan that QR code with your smart device. So if you've got a tablet or a smartphone, if you scan that QR code, that can take you to the Menti website, or you can use the URL uh, menti.com with uh, FG2ERD5586, or you can go straight to menti.com and type in that magic number of 41936091. And if you're in, if you just tap a little, you can do a like just to let us know that you're connected. Um, the more the merrier, because I will be asking for a bit of feedback and your thoughts on a couple of items as we go through. Uh, I'm quite sure after the last joyful year, uh, that was a bit of sarcasm, that everybody's overwhelmed with the amount of virtual conferences hanging out at the end of web chat. So I'm, I'm trying to bring that conference feeling of where you can actually engage with the audience. Um, I know I've missed it. Um, and so by using the tool like Mentimeter, another big one is Kahoot. Uh, it allows you to engage with the audience. And I'll, we will be sharing the slide deck from this, and it will have the answers that you folks add to it. And uh, Improving will also be sharing the video uh, once it's been tidied up, etc. So that's, that'll all be available. Um, so give it a couple more seconds to let other people log in. That code will persist as we go through. And when we get to exercises, the, the couple of exercises, it will appear again. So I can see we've got roughly a little bit under half of you have uh, chosen to join, which is awesome. And so I'd like to start moving on if that's okay. Uh, and also, Chris has kindly put the link in the chat. If you click on that, that'll get you there as well. So growth and change. One of the biggest questions that I've often heard organisations and leaders ask is, is it worth it investing in our people? And this is quite a, it's almost a meme, you know, what happens if we invest in developing our people and leave? And that's often argued from a financial view, viewpoint. But when we really consider it, what happens if we don't invest in our people and they stay? Now, I would argue that it is our accountabilities as individuals to grow ourselves, and it's a critical accountability of us as leaders to grow our teams. Now, it is through growing our teams that we make our organisations more resilient. It is by empowering our people with knowledge and understanding that we will nurture them to achieve their full potential. And then we can engage with our customers, our clients, our partners, and wider society to lift everyone that we work with. Now, we can't make people grow. What we can do is inspire them to grow. And I would suggest a true leader's success is measured not by the number of people they're leading, but the number of people they inspire to be leaders. And it is in our gift to lead up, down, and around so that we help everybody that we're working with 
to achieve their full potential and so that they can get the maximum enjoyment and productivity out of their time. Regardless of the industry you worked in, and I've had the privilege to work in a wide range of industries from um, well, pretty well everything from uh, science, robotics, oil and gas, finance, retail, pharmaceuticals, uh, government. Now, every one of those organisations have got super smart people that are trying to do things to create good value for the customers and clients. For that to be successful, we need to provide the space for them to be able to move on, grow and adapt to the changing conditions that are around them. Does that make sense? I hope. So what I'd like to do now is just test the power of the mentee. When we say growth and change, what are the three words that come to your mind? when you consider growth and change. So what you should do now is if you look at the web page or the app, you should see uh, the opportunity to add up to three words. And what you wonderful people are going to do now is you are going to generate a tag cloud of words that come to mind when you think about growth and change. And as words come in, uh, the, the, the tag cloud will grow. This is almost a, a magical moment because you can see that, that tag cloud reconfiguring on the fly. It's rather beautiful. So I'm seeing the word opportunity start out and it was at the core and it's just kept, it stayed at the core. It's kept growing and growing, which is awesome. Other words that are really leaping out to me are improvement, learning, development, and a wonderful word, adaptation. Well, one of the many hats I wear is that of a professional scrum trainer, and scrum is based on empiricism, which is transparency, inspection, and adaptation. And adaptation is the key to survival. To paraphrase Darwin, it is not the strongest nor the smartest of the species that will survive. It is that which is most capable for adaptation. And if we look at the businesses that have thrived in the last year and a half, it is those that were able to pivot quickly from the constraints that the COVID pandemic has forced upon us, being able to embrace different ways of working, to be able to nurture a collaborative environment where people were still able to be productive and achieve their value whilst working in some crazy conditions as this situation unraveled around us because it was completely unpredictable what had happened. In a space of a week to a month, the world shut down. And I managed to, I was particularly fortunate, I was working with an amazing client and I literally surfed the beachhead of that virus back from Australia to the United Kingdom at the start of last year. And it was crazy to see the change happen. And it went from busy traveling to absolutely nothing at home in the space of a couple of weeks. Now, that created, there's a word there that leapt out of me then, which is fear. The absolute terror of me having to relearn my craft and pivot to deliver what I do in a home environment was frankly terrifying because I had to rebuild my skill base. But that was then inspiring. So I had to get over that resistance hump to be able to get there. So I'm, I'm going to move on. And uh, I'm so delighted to see so many of you engaging in that tag cloud. That is just, uh, you can see we've got nearly 70 responses. Thank you, everyone. That's just wonderful. So what does that give us as a leader? Now, when I think about growth and leadership and change, the model that I would like to use is a classic bullseye model. And at the start, as leaders, 
we need to be clear on our purpose. Now, by our purpose, I mean this beyond just the direction we're traveling in, but the manner in which we are going to achieve it. So if we deliver what our customers, partners, clients need, but we compromise our values in the way of doing it, or we destroy the planet as we do it, we have disrupted our own purpose. So whilst we might achieve a short-term outcome, our long-term outcome, our true purpose will be denied. If our people do not engage with that purpose, they will not have that true direction for them to be able to make choices to achieve the outcome that we need. So communicating that purpose is our primary responsibility. The next level out of that, once people understand what it is we need them to do and the manner in which we would like them to deliver that, we then need to articulate the boundaries or constraints of the situation that they're working in. Some of them are very clear. They could be regulatory constraints. It could be safety constraints. It might be risk constraints. And then we have the classic project constraints of time, capital, capacity, and resources. When we make it explicit where the boundaries are, we enable our people to make the best choices because they understand the edges of the sandpit that they're playing in. So those constraints are critical if we want our people to self-manage. Self-management cannot occur in a vacuum. And an organisation that doesn't have clear purpose and constraints ends up being chaotic and you often will see a political or a Game of Thrones type environment or even worse, a diaspora and the wonderful energy of that organisation then gets dispersed because everybody heads in a different direction because the constraints or boundaries aren't there. In order to grow that, we then need to build trust. Now, trust is a wonderful thing, and there is a financial impact on it as well as a human impact on it. Now, trust is not a naive trust. It isn't given away uh, without some sort of thought. So for, for us to grow that trust, we're going to need to ensure our people are competent, that they have got the ability to exercise appropriate judgment within the constraints we give them. You know, I'm not going to give a sharp kitchen knife to a three-year-old because that would just be dangerous. Like I'm going to end up with a very messy situation. And that would be on me as the leader because I've given inappropriate tooling to somebody who has not got the capability of using that tooling properly. It's the same within our organizations. So we need to work with our teams to grow their ability so that they are comfortable and confident to make the choices within the constraints. So if we talk about self-management and empowerment, it is our accountability to ensure that people are comfortable and confident to take that empowerment, to self-manage. Because you cannot take people from a, a, a structure where they don't have that freedom and space to say, okay, all the decisions are your own, because all of a sudden they're not equipped for it. And that is will be on you as a leader. If you take people that quickly without in nurturing them to that space, that's on you. So you're setting them up for failure. So on the back of that model, I would suggest that there are a few habits or considerations we need to consider. The first one is the environment. Now, your organisation has an environment that is defined. Our people will need three key things to be able to flourish and grow. The first thing is desire. If people don't have a motivation, an intrinsic motivation, a want, almost a need to act, develop a new skill, a new talent, a new capability, 
it will be impossible for them to get there. So the, that's our first thing, to promote the desire to learn and grow and change. The second thing that we need to do is provide them with the opportunity. So, and for this, we need to think about what opportunity will meet each individual. Because if we provide somebody with a desire to grow and change with the wrong opportunity, they will not move in that way. So for instance, if I'm looking at the plant metaphor, if I put a cactus in a, a greenhouse that's very humid, it's not going to flourish. In the same way, we need to ensure that we match people's desire to grow and change with the opportunities that we have available in our organization. The third thing, and this is critical, is to give people the space. Learning takes energy, effort, and time. For that, we need to give them capacity. How many times have you seen in your variety of careers where people are given bonus roles. Oh, you're doing wonderfully at that role. How about you take on this role? It's a wonderful growth opportunity for you. I'm not going to relieve you of any of your current duties. I'm just going to give you a bonus 20% worth of activity. Yes, uh, Arlene, the recording is going to be shared afterwards. Great question. Um, so, as leaders, we need to create that time and space. Now, when we do this, we need to have that discussion with our other leadership team, our management, our peers, our leaders above us, to protect that time and space so that it isn't eroded with what I call NERT's work. NERT's work is need it right this second. Now, every organization has this. There's always more work than we have capacity. Your biggest challenge will be educating your team that they need to protect their development time. To do that, you will need to protect your development time. And that leads me to my first habit, which is being genuine. So there's seven habits that I'd like to discuss. Now, a habit is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary. So being based in the UK, that's the one I'll go to. Um, so being in England, using that dictionary is the, the default. Right, so a habit and the noun form is something done regularly enough that it becomes automatic. So almost unconscious. Uh, I'm, I know at the start of the, the COVID pandemic, uh, I didn't realize how many times I touched my face during the day. I think I've broken that habit. But it was fascinating when that came out, being aware of how many times you were touching your face. The seven habits I would encourage you to adopt is be genuine, nurture trust, start from the bootstraps up, pick a framework to learn and grow, get her done. You have to complete one learning before picking another. Short feedback loops are key. And the last one, look outside. So I'd now like to explore those and I'd like you to tie them back if you can. Think about how they fit with that triple model of purpose, constraints and trust. So being genuine. For this to work, for growth and change to work, you're going to have to drink your own champagne. That means you will need to apply these habits to yourself and model that behavior for your team. Also by being genuine, when you're talking with your team, when you're working with them, be there as a whole person and show up and genuinely care about them. Uh, what is it, P.T. Barnum once said, the hardest thing to fake is sincerity. It's much easier if you're just genuine. Now, if you've had a rough day or if you don't have capacity, it's entirely okay to say, I'm not, 
I haven't got time or space at the moment. Can we move this to X, Y, Z? But by being genuine, we're saying turn up as a whole person, connect with your team members as people, accept and embrace diversity, accept people who they are as they stand. Allow them to guide you as to where they would like to go and care for them and their careers genuinely. In my experience, when you do that, people will respond genuinely and you'll be able to find the right place for them to grow and be nurtured. The reward is them growing. So that whole point of being genuine and honouring that, demonstrating that, will grow the most critical aspect of any successful organisation, which is a high degree of trust. A high trust culture is worth billions. Stephen Covey wrote about it in The Speed of Trust. It's the foundation of empiricism because without trust, people will not share with you what's really going on. People will not believe you. So when you ask them to inspect and adapt, you will find yourself double checking what you do and what your team does. So how do we grow trust? By being present, being genuine and honoring any commitment you make. So if you make a commitment to someone and meet it, your trust capital grows. Now, trust is like a bank account, and most people start with a minimal amount of trust from everyone. But once you break trust, unless you have sufficient capital, it will be hard to top that back up. So when we're working with our team members, it's important that we are mindful about not overcommitting. And this is why trust comes from the second habit of being genuine. Aligned with trust, I would also encourage you to show compassion. Now, compassion needs to start from yourself. If you are unable to show compassion for yourself, I learned <laughs> if you can't show compassion for yourself, you will not be able to show compassion for the people around you. So being kind, if you do breach trust, admit it, own it, restore it. And that gives you an opportunity to rebuild it because we're all human, we're going to make mistakes, and that's okay. It's okay to make a mistake. What's not okay is not to clean up the mess once we've made a mistake. So if we own the mistake and then clean it up, we can then restore that trust and in some cases build stronger trust because you've shown that you care and that ties back to being genuine. The habit of from the bootstrap is critical to achieve your purpose or vision. Now, it is very easy to say, I can't. It's important that you start where you are and you look for the smallest possible thing that you can do. There's a great technique Amazon use a lot, which is they start from the press conference at the end. You can work back from your success story. Once you've achieved this particular phase of growth, what would amazing look like? Now, it's really important that you aim for amazing or awesome. Don't aim for average or mediocrity, because if we aim for amazing and we don't hit it, at least we'll be good. If we aim for mediocrity and we don't hit it, we'll be less than good. And if we work towards that being awesome, in small steps, it is entirely achievable. So for yourself, for your individuals and for your teams, what is the next smallest step that they can make to be better without any involvement from people from the outside, any extra capital, any extra kit, any extra resource. And if we think about the art of the possible and the next smallest step, 
We're starting from where we are, from the bootstraps, and then we can start the momentum. Lao Tzu wrote, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. And it's often overcoming that inertia of change, that fear, that resistance. If we can get one step in that direction, we then begin moving and it makes it a whole lot easier. Which leads to the next habit. Build a growth or learning mindset. Now, a growth mindset is very different to a fixed mindset. Now, when we have a growth mindset, we become aware that there will be challenges ahead. We know that we don't know all the answers, but we see them as opportunities to learn and go, grow. We'll see the effort not as a waste, but an investment. We won't become scared of putting ourselves into and engaging in what's going on, but helping us achieve it. Because change is hard. It takes less than three days to forge a new bad habit. It can take up to 30 consistent days to forge a good new habit. So moving forward, moving to that more productive space will require energy and investment. And this is also tying back to the previous point of compassion. If you stumble, which is going to happen, be kind to yourself and just go, okay, I stumble, back on the journey. And this is where the growth mindset kicks in because now we're looking at what we're learning and what we're taking from situations so that we can be a stronger, more confident, more capable person. And this means that we're building a learning culture. Now, a learning culture means that there is no blame. And it's the scientific approach. Uh, and a crazy thing, like I started out my career as an analytical chemist. And one of the things I love about chemistry, an experiment never fails. With an experiment, we will have a hypothesis and it'll either be validated or refuted. It's purely objective. Regardless of the outcome of the experiment, we have learning. And if we embrace that as a leader, as an organization, as teams and individuals, what we create is a psychologically safe place where we can learn about what is going to do best for our organization, our customers, clients, and partners. Now, that means that we're going to have to put some effort in because we have to frame things in a way that we say we don't know as a hypothesis. We're going to have to use that feedback, even if it's negative, as a gift. So we take that feedback, involve it, um, embrace it, learn from it, and move onwards. And often a really scary thing is you'll see other people succeeding or flourishing around you. With a growth mindset, you will see that as inspiration. Hey, they're, they're doing this. It can be done. The world is a wonderfully rich place and there's more than enough opportunity for all of us, for all companies to grow, thrive and survive. And if we can build an ecosystem where we as individuals, teams, organisations work together to lift each other, we're going to create more opportunities. And what we've seen in the last year is organisations that are willing to do that have thrived. Organisations that have become mired in fear and that fixed mindset are shutting down and many of them have disappeared. So it's a conscious choice we need to make. To guide us, we're going to need some sort of guardrails. We're going to need a framework for this. Now, by a framework, I'm not saying uh, a process framework. I'm thinking about what sort of outcomes are you looking for? How are you going to define them? And having an agreed pattern with your individuals and teams. So this might need certification from various bodies. It might need training. There might need to be checks and balances. 
compliance, external audit. How are you going to audit your investment? Because remember when I said trust is given, it shouldn't be a naive trust, nor should your investment in learning and growth be naive. As an experiment, when we're running experiments, there are always measures around it. What will you be measuring to ensure that the impact of your investment achieves the outcome that you need for your individuals and teams? And so these frameworks will emerge in discussions with your people and teams. And one of the structures I really like using is pathways so that you can have that discussion what, um, where you want people to go, what the purpose they're looking for, how you're going to get there, and then using the pathway to guide them through those learning steps so that they can make those small steps one at a time and that they can then think of uh, materials, resources, uh, people, ways that they can then grow that. I hope that makes sense so far. My next question for you all, within your immediate team and organisation, how are your constraints shared? So what I've done here is I've given you four options and I'd like you to split 100 points between these four options. Are all your constraints open and clear? Can people tell you exactly what your constraints are, what they're working with it? Are they referred to? So you talk about them, but they're not totally explicit. Are they implied so that there's constraints and people are aware of them, but they're not uh, explicit, they're not, they're not referred to, they're just implied? Or are they hidden? Now, a hidden constraint uh, is one that people may not be aware of until they butt up against it. Uh, there's a number of times I've done that. Um, so, for instance, I was working as a software engineer and it came time to do the release and we found out that the product didn't meet one of the compliance standards. And the compliance standard was there, but it was hidden. And it was only when you went to release that we found out about it. So we've got 26 people so far and just watching uh, feedback there. So going back to that model, remember the, the bullseye model I shared at the start. So we've got purpose, constraints, trust. And now I'm sort of working my way back in, starting from trust. We're at constraints now. I would assert if people don't know where the edges of their sandpit are, they are going to either spread the sand everywhere out of the sandpit or come unstuck. Now, if you have a, a plant, how do you grow that plant unless you know what kind of environment that plant will need to grow in? So it's interesting. We've got roughly half the audience has managed to respond now. And you'll see that over half of the constraints are not open and clear. So we've got about half of it's implied or hidden. So my invitation to you all, if there's one takeaway you can take out of this, how can you help those constraints be more open and clear? How can you help your individuals and teams discover the constraints that they're working with? Uh, so we've got open and clear moving up now in contention with referred to, so it's a much better balance. But if we can help our teams understand the boundaries that they're working in, we're going to get a lot better performance, output and outcome because people are working within the boundaries of the remit they're on. So is anyone, I'll leave it there for a couple of seconds more. Does anyone else like to contribute to the, the poll? So it's great to see that nearly a third of you are working with open and clear, like 30% out of this short sample 
30% of your constraints are open and clear, which is wonderful. So I'll move along now. Um, so I've got a question there. Can I give a practical example of constraints? Certainly. Right. So first one, uh, the easy one, money. Money is a wonderful constraint. How much budget do you have? Another one is time. Do you have, um, if we're talking about a development uh, situation, do your team have clear understanding of how much money they're allowed to spend on their training? Do you have a clear training budget allocated? Is there amount of time capacity that people are able to record for their development? Do you encourage or support people going and working with other teams, nurturing inside your organization, holding meetups, working outside your organization? If your organization explicitly sets that up, that would be a constraint. So uh, resources, capability, uh, do you allow people to buy unlimited number of books? So a constraint could be you can go on the course, however, you have to come back and do a lunch and learn on it. You can buy the book, but we want to see a book review or summary. And that's only fair if you're going to let people invest in that learning that they give back. Do, does that help, Stephanie? Does that, does that give a clear example? I'll, I'll assume so. Um, so time, uh, resources, capacity, budget. Uh, when we're building our products now, the thing is that we have to be really careful, uh, depending on the industry you're in, um, health and safety, uh, risk and compliance. So if you're working in financial industries, you've got to be very careful about compliance, stuff like that. Uh, a lot of the larger industries, like if you're working in heavy industry, uh, civil engineering, oil and gas, safety. Safety comes first. Um, so constraints are there. Uh, moving on. Um, done. Now, as, as a professional scrum trainer and a fan of Agile in general, you have to get one piece done before moving to the next. My metaphor for this is basic table manners, right? When we're sharing a meal with people, take a mouthful of food, put it in your mouth, chew, swallow before getting more food, right? Don't take food out of your mouth, half chewed. Don't put food in your mouth when you've still got a mouthful. It's the same thing with work, with learning. If we try and take too many learning activities on at a time, it can often overwhelm it and we'll get too much confusion of what's going on. Have clarity around what done or complete looks like for each learning objective. Make sure that uh, the people that you're working with understand what finished looks like so that they can get there. So that's a constraint. I will know that you have done this particular part of your learning journey when you can do X, Y, Z. You can demonstrate this particular outcome. Without that done, you're probably going to miss achieving that growth target. And so for this, in the similar way when we're working with products, I would encourage you to help people build their careers and treat their careers as a product. So only you are accountable for your career. And when we grow this stuff, what we really need to think about is what's your goals? Now, you might look for a five-year goal. I would encourage you to start, if you haven't got it, start with a yearly goal. From the year, go down to a quarter, quarter to a month. In my experience, trying to have learning and growth goals shorter than a month often means the feedback loop is too tight and people will usually, or often, not have the capacity to achieve the, what they want within that month. Because life's busy, right? Because this is part of what they're doing. And by having that monthly feedback cycle means that they can then be inspired that they're making progress. Because if you check in too frequently and they're not making progress, people can become disheartened. And so remember, our role is to inspire them. So we need to set a feedback cycle 
that is agreed with the people and to give them the opportunity to progress. Now, if we don't set a time frame, if we don't have a time box on it, if we give people an unlimited amount of time, if they're anything like me at all, they'll probably not do anything, right? So one of the things I know about myself, if I'm going to get something done, I need a deadline. And it's probably a hangover from my, my misspent youth in my uni days. I wouldn't start writing to my assignments or, or writing up any documents until probably the latest irresponsible moment. So the latest irresponsible moment is the bare minimum time to get it done. And then you just stay up all night and get it done. I've got a little bit better at that over the last 40 years, but not much. Uh, so I'm still trying to do it. So what I do now is I set myself clear goals and targets and then check in against that because that provides the, the focus and the motivation to make the achievement. The next habit is feedback, embracing feedback. Now, feedback is a gift and we should open ourselves up to it when you receive feedback, uh, the first word should be thank you, whether it's positive or negative. And I would also encourage you to listen for the positive. It is very easy to focus on constructive criticism or negative feedback. Ensure that you're fair to yourself and your team by listening to the positive feedback. Now, also, feedback should go two ways. So when you're providing feedback to your team members or to another person, make sure that you give them the opportunity to share the feedback with you because that way you then have a feedback loop and you're not just feedback broadcasting but creating and, in for, and encouraging, enhancing the trustful, genuine relationship with the people that you're working with. So how do we practically implement these feedback loops? Well, there's a list of practical techniques, mentoring, have a mentor, encourage mentoring within your organisation, pairing between people. So you can pair between many skill sets. Now, if you pair between two people who have a low domain knowledge, they will need to then have their, their study, their learning checked in with a mentor because if they don't have the domain knowledge, it is potentially dangerous. They may go off rails a bit. So when we're pairing, it can often be very helpful to have somebody with a higher level of domain knowledge pairing with someone in a lower level of domain knowledge because that helps them grow. Coaching is very helpful if somebody has the domain knowledge there and they just need some advice and reflection. If people don't have domain knowledge, that is where mentoring is much more applicable. If you're trying to coach people who don't have the rudimentary skills or the understanding, they will not be able to answer the questions in and of themselves. To open it up to a broader community, having a study group or a community of practice is a great way of getting practical examples for from others and being able to open up that feedback loop so that we can then learn and cultivate and have fresh ideas. Now, particularly when you're time challenged, if everyone brings a small idea together, you'll be able to get a pool of ideas and refresh your outlook and refresh your mindset. Now, I've noticed this particularly as a, an agile agilist working with organisations when we create that community of practice within an organisation, it becomes easier for people to share the joys and the travails of their particular learnings and being able to re-energise by sharing that with somebody else who understands what they're going through. And this is also the power of meetups. Now, one of the upsides of this whole pandemic is a lot of the meetups have become virtual. So if, if you have the energy, you could probably be on a meetup just about any, any hour of the day on any topic that you wanted. But by engaging with meetups, it allows you to engage, uh, get that refreshment uh, similar to a community of practice. The last habit is look outside. 
Now, it's often really easy to get caught looking inside and thinking about what's going on immediately, firstly with me, then my team, then my department, division, organisation. I'd strongly encourage you to look up and look beyond the immediate. See if you can have a conversation with colleagues from different organisations, maybe a similar style of organisation in a different location. What's going on beyond the immediate? So by being able to look outside, we'll be able to see what's going on with our peer and with the market. Because if we're so focused internally, it can often create a situation where we're not even aware of emerging trends or wonderful opportunities or new learnings. So it's really important that we bust out of the bubble. And so uh, as an Agilist, one of the things I really like doing is looking for groups that aren't focused on Scrum or Kanban or Agile so that I can build up a broader knowledge or understanding of the world and so that I can grow outside of the little agile echo chamber that you'll often see. And social media can be quite dangerous for this because if you start following certain groups in social media and because of all the, the machine learning and AI, they'll just keep pushing you stuff from that little bubble. So get out of the echo chamber, look outside and look beyond the immediate. So when we build these seven habits in, as Richard Branson says, what we're doing is training people well enough so that they can leave and treating them well enough that they don't want to so that we create an inspiring learning culture that we can have people come in, grow and nurture. When I had the, the privilege of working um, with Wintelect, John Robbins referred to everybody who left Wintelect after working with them as alumni, which is a wonderful growth mindset because what they're saying is that people came here, we worked together, did wonderful things, and then when we moved on, they then looked back fondly of that organisation and he was inspiring leaders. And people are much like plants. You don't grow a plant by pulling it up because all you do is you'll expose the root system and kill it. What we can only do is inspire people by creating the appropriate conditions for them to grow. And they might start off inside. You might need to start them under a grow light in very controlled conditions so that they can then build the hardiness and the resilience to go out to a different environment. But hopefully that small seedling, that, that person that comes in looking for growth, will eventually thrive in the wonderful environment outside and so that you can then unleash them and their true potential is outside. So once you have nourished someone and provided that inspiration for them, hopefully they'll have the roots in the ground and the wings to fly. And so if we can build the roots and the wings into all our people, we will inspire the next generation of leaders and the management of our change will become easier because we will have a whole organisation full of inspired, motivated people who can then build the next generation of our organisations. And that brings me to the end. Are there any questions? There's a question. Uh, if you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, please do. At the end of this presentation, I'll have my contact details. Uh, so more than happy, be delighted to um, connect on LinkedIn, other social media. Uh, if you never want to hear from me, probably Twitter. Uh, I'm probably the world's second best, uh, second worst Twitter user ever. So I'm trying to get better at social media, but um, LinkedIn is probably the easiest, but I'll share all my contact details uh, at the, the last slide. Um, 
if anyone's got any any questions, more than happy, more than happy to take any questions. Oh, it's a great one. Do you think that Scrum techniques can be applied beyond IT projects to change how every team works? Yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt. I've built robots with it. I've built defense systems with it. Uh, I've worked with teams that have built ships with it. I've worked with teams that have built drilling plans for an oil well with it. Uh, I've worked teams, uh, legal campaigns, marketing campaigns, um, audit, compliance, uh, pharmaceutical products, pretty well anywhere. So remember that Scrum is a lightweight framework. You can use it to do whatever you want. And what it will do is just provide that process framework for you to be able to explore what value is. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan of Scrum, uh, having used it for over 20 years. Um, so using, yes, for complex problems. Yes, I agree, Poppy. Uh, Scrum is ideal for complex problems. You, there's so many techniques out there. And also don't become uh, tunnel visioned, right? So Scrum is a great framework. Kanban's a great framework. Project management's a great framework. Uh, you've got to right, use the right tool for the right thing. I don't want to use a Swiss army knife to cut down a tree and I don't want to use a chainsaw to peel my orange. You know, you right tool for the job. Um, Scrum to strategic planning, that conversation would probably need a couple of beers. Um, so when we start thinking about portfolio management, I would probably tend to start thinking in um, broader terms and I would probably looking at some form of Kanban um, so that I have got some metrics to be able to forecast. So Scrum teams can roll up to Kanban, um, but I'd really want to start thinking about um, strategic planning and breaking down from uh, my very high portfolio level and breaking it down into chunks and being able to track that through some throughput metrics. Um, I, would, I, I think when we start working at product level, I'd encourage you to have a look at evidence-based management um, and I, I think that's something we, you know, I'll, I'll share the link to that. <clears throat> um, COVID mental health issues is, is the next question. I think that we really need to be very mindful of the impact of working from home and the COVID situation. Um, remember that people haven't had a lot of opportunity to think I'm going to start working from home and a transitioned environment. Uh, in the UK, we had about two days notice and we we're in lockdown. And all of a sudden, people are working from home. And that meant people had to give up personal space, some of it their most favourite space, to then turn into their workspace. Um, I really love gaming. And there have been times where I didn't even want to game on my computer because it became associated with a workspace and I wanted to go and do something different. So that to me was pretty scary that I didn't want to do one of the things I love doing. Um, so I think it's probably going to take time for us to allow ourselves and our teams to heal from all of the issues that have come out with COVID. I know so many people who have been affect, affected by uh by losing someone um, and just the change in life. So uh, I think the positive is that we've learned virtual can work, distributed can work. However, we're going to have to be kind to people to recover from it. Um, the next question is, uh, is there a framework or model we could use to navigate a conversation about the purpose and the paths and the goals and horizons? Um, yeah, so with this, um, I would typically start using a, a product canvas, a product roadmap. Uh, my mate, Ralph yockham has got a really nice product canvas that builds a dashboard up. Um, so I would often start with, um, start thinking about purpose, creating a vision statement, and then working that through into breaking it down into chunks. Uh, I'll find that link to Ralph's product uh, product canvas and share that part. Uh, that's probably the best way to do that one. Uh, Daniel, a different one. Uh, what kind of computer games? Um, first person shooters mostly, Call of Duty, that sort of stuff, Battlefield. 
um, yeah, mindless, mindless stuff. But I don't go uh, massively online because all the young people wipe me out too quickly. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure that I've got a link to, to Ralph's uh, product canvas and I'll make sure that that's shared as, as part of the, the mop up of this. And that brings us to the top of the hour. Um, I really, really appreciate you all giving up an hour of your precious time. Thank you so much for the engagement. I've really appreciated seeing the stuff come in from the chat and the Q&A. Um, I wish you a wonderful afternoon, evening, day, morning, uh, wherever you're at. Uh, stay well, stay safe. Uh, thank you very much.